Rosemary, it's a real privilege to speak to you. You are an astronaut and you're following in the footsteps of Tim Peake. They're not bad shoes to be filling, are they? Um, tell us a little bit about where your, where your journey started, I guess. Well, the, it's hard to know where exactly the journey started, like you say. Um, really, really happy to be following in the footsteps of, of Tim Peake as, a, as an Easter astronaut and also of Helen Sharman as a, the first Brit to, to be going to space. Um, I'm an astrophysicist by training. I did a PhD in astrophysics, so that's kind of my background. And then I was selected um, by ESA to be an astronaut in the 2022 um, call for selection. And it was about a year and a half selection process leading up to that point. Wow. And it's really just the, the beginning of the journey in that sense. So what does the election process consist of? Um, so the selection was six different stages yeah. over about a year and a half. And the, of course, you, you send in your motivation letter, you explain kind of why you want to, to do the role. And if you make it through that stage, you, you face things like computer-based tests in maths and physics, a lot of spatial awareness, your kind of your memory in terms of if you can see things and remember them, if you can hear things and remember them, uh, a full day of these sorts of computer-based tests. And then the, the following selection uh, processes were things like looking at how you work in a team, uh, traditional interviews with um, members of ESA and also with psychologists, a lot of psychological assessments and medical assessments as well. So it was quite varied what they were looking for. And then you go into to training, I guess. And how challenging is the training? Yeah, so we started our training in April um, 23. So we had 13 months of what's called basic training, which is this um, sort of internationally agreed syllabus for the basic training that all astronauts from um, internationally should receive. And that was really split between classroom-based activities, so um, looking at the different sciences, so kind of a lot of biology and physics, engineering, climate sciences, earth science, um, geology, this sorts of thing. And then also a lot of really hands-on training. So, um, for example, going in the centrifuge to see how launch and re-entry would feel, parabolic flights to experience zero gravity, and also survival training for when we re-enter. So it was a really fantastic uh, year or so for graduation. What was the hardest thing about that? I think what was perhaps most challenging was just how many different things there were and really, really varied. So I think until now, my experience of, of studying has been to, to start to specialise into things. You, you do a PhD and you almost go more and more deep into one particular field. But actually, in your role as an astronaut, because you're facilitating the science of so many different scientists on the ground, you've all got completely different interests and completely different experiments. You need to have quite a broad understanding of so many different things. So it was quite intense in that sense. Mm. I think the intensity was probably one of the, yeah. uh, the most challenging things. Historically, it's been a very male-dominated industry. Do you feel like that's changing? I think we're definitely seeing more and more diversity in the space, center, uh, space sector which is absolutely fantastic. Um, if I can take the, the astronauts within the European Space Agency as an example, um, in the 2009 selection, in total, they selected seven astronauts, one of whom uh, was a woman, Samantha Cristofretti. And now, in the, the five Easter astronauts who've just been through basic training, it's two female and three male. So we're, we're almost reaching that kind of 50-50. Um, in the, the 17 of us who were selected, including the reserves, we are, again, almost exactly 50-50. Um, so it's definitely moving in the right direction. Of course, you know, diversity within the space sector goes beyond gender. Of it's, course. it's also people's backgrounds. It's, you know, diversity needs to be looked at really as a, as a whole. But I think it's really important and luckily we are moving that direction. Do you think it's a generational thing? I mean, I don't think my mum, for example, would have necessarily considered even talking to me about space or buying me a rocket as a child whereas do you feel like that's changing as well I do think that's changing I do think it's it's definitely it's an intentional kind of shift and it's it's really kind of it's individuals it's you know teachers parents organizations it goes up right up to the very top the, the people who can have an impact on how a young person views their future views mm. their possibilities and it's, it is very difficult to imagine yourself doing something if no one's ever mentioned it to you or you've never seen someone else doing it. It's, 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 it's just the way it is, unfortunately. Mm. So it's really important for us to, to talk about all of the options that are out there for you know, young people from all backgrounds. And I think 
yeah, hopefully that, like we were talking about it today, that's already yeah. a great start. So what advice would you give to a child who wants to go into the space sector who in the past perhaps wouldn't have ever thought that that was an opportunity for them? I would say if, if they're interested in it, to absolutely to go for it and to really look into the options. I mean, I think you know, one of the, the privileges of, of being in the job of an astronaut is being able to, to come and talk about these things. But it's really important to remember that being an astronaut isn't the only job in the space sector by yeah. any stretch. You know, as an astronaut, you are supported by thousands and thousands of people from the engineers and the project managers, and there's so many different roles within the space sector. So if you think you might be interested in space in any capacity, then absolutely look at what is there, and I think you will find something that really suits your interests and your abilities as well. So how does your future look? What's next for you? Um, so the, the five of us who graduated from basic training in April, um, we know that our first mission will be um, to the International Space Station for six months. We'll be going one at a time um, between 2026 and 2030. So I know that that will be the, the first mission that I go on and that's what I'm training for at the moment. Uh, are you excited? Yes, I am so excited. Are you nervous? Yes. <laughs> I think more excitement than anything. It's, uh, it's, it's been an absolute kind of roller coaster so far in terms of emotions, being selected and you know, entering these next phases of training. It's incredibly exciting, but I think wow. we are, yeah, we're all really looking forward to what the future brings. I know that you've been doing some quite pioneering research, haven't you, into black holes and various other things. And I wondered if you can just elaborate on, on that and what your findings have been. So, so my background in astrophysics is mainly looking at galaxy evolution, so looking at how distant galaxies um, grow and evolve. And I'm particularly interested in looking at galaxies that I would say they existed. Um, we, we see the light coming from them about 10 billion years ago, so they're quite distant in our, in our universe. And the, the interest, um, particularly for me, was to see whether if a galaxy is in a cluster with lots of other galaxies, does that grow, does that make stars differently to a galaxy that's all by itself, essentially, um, alone in the field? And we are seeing these differences in galaxy um, formation pathways, and that tells us a lot about what we see in the big picture when we look at the sky, why galaxies are different shapes and sizes and how we've ended up where we are today. Wow, how fascinating.